Hi, I'm Lisa. I am with the SHARE Project here in Haywood County, and our mission statement, if you will, is spreading hope and awareness and removing the epidemic stigma. And part of the interview today is about bringing awareness, sharing awareness. Um, I am with Mandy Haithcox, um, who is with Pathways here in Haywood County, and um, it is a resource for homeless, mm -hmm. um, as well as others, which we are going to talk about in some of this conversation. So we're going to let Mandy share some of that, what, what other resources there are. Sure. But I do want her to tell us a little bit about herself and what got her started in what I would call a ministry, yeah. um, primarily. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, this, you know, yes, you are making this your work, mm -hmm. work. But yes, it, yeah. it does take a special kind of person to be able to do something like this. So, so tell me a little bit about yourself, where you're from, if you're from here in Haywood County, mm -hmm. what got you into doing this kind of thing in the first place? Sure. And, yeah. Uh, so I'm not from Haywood County. Okay. I'm kind of from all over. Um, officially Minnesota, but I moved to North Carolina from Texas. Okay. And we had lived there um, probably 15 years before I moved to North Carolina to come to graduate school. But I started work with folks in crisis and in poverty um, 20 years ago wow. already. <laughs> um, and it was that, that very first internship that sort of changed my life. So I wanted to go to school to become a child psychologist. I was going to have my own shingle and make a lot of money. And then I did an internship um, at a faith-based organization that provided crisis counseling for kids and their families um, for any kind of crisis, really, anything from... I don't like my parents, too. I'm about to fail out of school and, okay. you know, mm -hmm. do a lot of life skills and goal setting, things like that. And it was through those first two, three summers there that it really became very obvious to me that, you know, people deserve quality care regardless of if they can pay for it or not. Okay. And at that point, it just, I knew that going for all these certifications and things like this in order to make money was not who I was and it, it just felt right to be with folks yeah. who needed help that were going to be otherwise overlooked or ignored and I think starting there working with the families and and because I was I was inexperienced at the time I got the I got the little kids <laughs> I okay. got the softballs right so I did a lot of play therapy and stuff like that and it really just became obvious, even at that point, that if we want to change the future, then we need to break, or at least interrupt, some of the negative cycles that you see generation after generation. And that has been true no matter where I've worked since then, yes. um, whether it be Durham or here or Asheville or, or wherever. Yes. yes. So that's kind of what brought me here. I, I went to graduate school to um, Duke Divinity School, so I have a okay. theology uh, um, Master's in Divinity okay. and a Master's in Social Work. Um, I did that because I wanted to be able to provide social work services from the perspective of being a Christian and I wanted to explore more what that meant to me. So yes. I never went to be a pastor. That's yeah. not my goal. Um, but it was very much to do this sort of work. Yes. So how long have you been at Pathways then? I've been here a little over three years. Okay. And how long has Pathways been here? Um, so September about that. 25th will be our sixth birthday. Sixth birthday, okay, mm -hmm. so six years. Yes. Okay, yes. so you've been here about half that, half that uh -huh. time then. Yeah. Okay. Um, and tell me about some of the other things. Okay. Tell me what Pathways is known for primarily, mm -hmm. which I kind of said in the opening, sure. uh, you know, a, a ministry to homeless. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, would that be the primary? Mm -hmm. Okay. It is. It's the primary thing yeah. that we do. Um, but it's not limited to, we're not just a homeless shelter. Yes. So, and that's what I want to talk yeah. to about because I have learned a lot yeah. about some of the other things. We do a lot more than just provide shelter. Um, you know, in the last, I'm not going to speak to before me cause I wasn't really here for that, but the people who came together, who saw a need, um, who saw, People who are struggling with addiction and poverty and the the cyclical nature of going in and out of jail knew that there had to be some sort of resource available for folks and so that's where that was all birthed out of um, three years ago we had a change in directors and at that point my experiences with programs and 
um, social work in general. And so we were able to initiate a whole bunch of different things. So we have structure to what we do. We are not just come in and sleep and leave and we hope the best happens for you. Um, our goals from the very beginning have been to feed the hungry, to house the homeless, and to reduce recidivism. And so I feel like in the last six years we've come to a place where we really are um, trying to deeply address all three of those things. So in terms of food, we provide and always have provided a community or a dinner meal, mm -hmm. a hot meal, yes. to anyone in the community who needs dinner. No questions asked. Okay. So um, not just the ones that are housed here. Correct. Okay. Anybody can come. Um, COVID has made that a little different. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, partially what the purpose of that was is to also provide community as well as food mm -hmm. for people who might be alone. Um, but because of COVID, we're still doing that. We're just providing to-go meals. So around 5.30 or so, people can come and pick up a meal if they okay. would like dinner. Okay. And you should go ahead and give yourself a plug about the food truck. Yes, we are opening a food truck. Yes, because I'm soon. excited about this. Yes. <laughs> we, you know, we've tried to come up with different uh, strategies to be to support ourselves mm -hmm. financially, and one of those is what's called the Holy Cow Food yes. Truck. Yes. Yep. I'm familiar. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's going to serve hamburgers and hot dogs, things like that. And you know, we are hoping to open in the next couple of weeks. Depends on when we get our freezer fixed. Oh, oh no. <laughs> our walk-in freezer died, and so we've had to. Um, to work on that but we'll be able to open in the next couple weeks small picture is it's going to be a stream of revenue for us yes bigger picture is that we can eventually get to a point where we are um, employing residents we are providing job awesome. training some yes. resume building yes. um, life skill yes. things um, that won't be right away but that's the bigger yeah that's big goal great that. great you yes. know we've been really fortunate to um, to be partners with Mana, so we pick up food okay. from Publix five days a week um, that's about five to eight hundred pounds of food a day. Um, that's more than we can eat. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's also allowed us to partner with like the Gleaners and Haywood Christian Ministries and Community Kitchen and some of the other resources okay. um, to get some of that excess food out and distributed yes. into the community, yes. um, particularly for the homebound seniors, people with disabilities, okay. things like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're doing with food. Um, in terms of housing the homeless, you know, we. We do provide cold gray shelter and when it in the winter time when it's 32 okay. degrees or below. Mm -hmm. And that's really for anybody who just wants to be warm for the night. You come in, get a bed, you get breakfast, and you're on your way. And that's usually folks who are not interested in the program um, or have, for whatever reason are not eligible for the program okay. but can still, I mean, we don't want anyone to freeze. Yes. The other part that we do is emergency shelter. So. That can be anywhere from one night to three nights, and that's just people, for example, we have somebody who has an apartment, but it's not ready till Friday. Mm -hmm. They're going to stay with us till Friday, then move into their apartment. They're not yeah. here for the program. So we'll do that. And then we also have our program. So if you're from Haywood County, if you can meet our eligibility requirements, so if you don't have any um, violent felonies, mm -hmm. um, you're not a registered sex offender, you can pass a drug screen and a breathalyzer. You can come into our program and you can stay for up to six months. Okay. And when you're in that program, you're working one-on-one -on -one with our case manager. Everybody makes a person-centered goal plan that focuses on income, housing, um, mental health, physical health, and sobriety. Okay. <laughs> I forgot there for a second. Yes. Uh, life skills development okay. and social support and spirituality. So okay, everyone's different, right? Yes. But we agree that... Holistically, we all need these things to be able to move forward in the world. Yes, so absolutely. We have this blank template, and then each person comes in and meets with the case manager and works on their goal to get to their next step. Okay. Um, we added our family program, our family dorm mm -hmm. for moms with kids last year, so it's been open just a little bit over a year. Um, and they do the exact same program, but they can stay for up to a year just because it takes longer for yes. families to get together. Mm -hmm. In terms of housing, that's what we do. Okay, so two, two down, one two to go. So, for, to <laughs> help reduce recidivism, you know, we had an informal relationship with the, with the um, detention center and with the sheriff's department for a really long time. Um, that's kind of where this whole thing was born out of. Um, but two years ago, we were able to um, secure a grant from the state of North Carolina uh, that was looking at opioid, the opioid epidemic. Mm -hmm. That allowed us to put um, an employment specialist here on our campus 
as well as a peer support here and put two peer supports within the detention center. Okay. That funding has since gone, but we've been able to, um, through community support and the Hayward Healthcare Foundation, we've been able to maintain those positions. Okay. So uh, we have two peer supports. They work inside the jail. Their office is in booking, so they literally okay. see everyone wow. come in and go yeah. out. Um, their goal has been to work with folks as they come in, especially those people who um, are clearly cyclical yes. attenders, mm -hmm. <laughs> if yeah. you will. Um, due to mental health and substance use issues. And the goal there is, you know, clearly, they're not necessarily dangerous criminal people. They have an issue, born probably out of trauma, mm -hmm. that needs addressing so that we can help people break that cycle and move somewhere else. Yes. Um, they do those same goal plans with those folks. Uh, they're able to um, interface with their attorneys, um, advocate for them, they do groups inside of the jail, so they do a lot of life skills and coping groups, but also um, one of them does a criminal addictive, criminal and addictive thinking class just to okay. understand how your brain is working, mm -hmm. um, to really identify what you can do next. They do an AA, an AA group as well. So what they have found is that, you know, prior to them, the only folks in the jail were the um, faith volunteers which, okay. you know, Haywood County Jail is known for having a tremendous program for that. They, there was never a social worker or someone like a peer support there. So what has happened then is that people have had an opportunity to have advocacy, especially in the legal arena, mm -hmm. that they never had before. And when you're in jail, you can't just outrightly use the phone. So there wasn't a real uh, clear way to communicate. Now there is, and there's a go-between. Yes. And so... What they found is that they've been able to get several folks connected um, into inpatient treatment okay. from jail as a an, as an alternative to going to okay. longer sentences yes. or something yes. like that. Now it's still up to the person if they stay mm -hmm. <laughs> and if they complete the program, but the option wasn't there mm -hmm. two years ago in the way that it is now. Yes. So that's one of the things that they're most excited about. That they yeah, that is, that's very exciting. Yeah. Very exciting. And you know, our CJ, our female peer support, has really found that a lot of people have, a lot of the women especially, have had so much trauma happen that the trauma is normal to them. And they, they don't, don't realize different. that it's not. Yes. Um, and so being able to be understood and heard and cared for um, in a different way has really changed a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think one of the questions you asked me at one point was how do they have such a high percentage of people connected to recovery yeah. at the end. So <clears throat> we work really hard with our partners. So a lot of that is people going to inpatient. Some of that is people being directly um, linked to Meridian. Okay. And a lot of that is they have been introduced to AA and NA, which they never had before. Yeah. Um, so they at least have been given the tools mm -hmm. <laughs> while they've been in there. Um, to move forward. So kind of what we're looking at next is how do we help folks once they've been released? Yes. Like where is that piece? Oh, yeah. It's you know? such a huge thing. And we have two beds in each dorm, mm -hmm. each um, set aside for folks who may need that. Mm -hmm. And so now we do have that formal partnership of if you're released and you need shelter, you yeah, can be yeah. here and those peer supports work for us so they can come over and yes, still work with you. Sure so there's yeah. that continuum. Mm -hmm. Um, but truth is, most people don't take advantage of that. No kidding. Um, I was going to ask a little bit about that. Yeah. There have been a handful yeah. that have. No kidding. Mm -hmm. So And so if they don't choose to do it, then what do they do? Do they have a family they go to, or they have just chosen to not continue what they've yeah. started in the, in the system? A lot of people go home. Yeah. Um, you know, our goal is that you're not going right back to the same environment yes. that got you where you were. Um, but, you know, we have no control over their choices, yep. which is frustrating. But Very frustrating. It's yeah. necessary also. Yeah. yeah. So tell me what some of the other, uh, you, you've mentioned now, you mentioned Meridian. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of your other partner organizations that you do work with? Sure. Um, Meridian's a big one. Mm -hmm. They... Um, Pre-COVID. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. Everything pre-COVID. We'll answer that <laughs> <right>. that way. <laughs> so the, normally, they would provide transportation even. So they would come to Pathways Monday through Friday, mm -hmm. pick up whoever needed a ride. 
they take them down to Meridian. As long as they completed at least one class or appointment, they bring them back. Okay. And so that was really helpful in making sure people got the services that they needed. So they've been a huge help. Um, when Blue Ridge Health opened um, and Good Samaritan transitioned into there, they have been extremely helpful as well. So um, most shelters, you know, the, the residents don't have a high percentage of health care, mm -hmm. and ours do, largely because of Blue Ridge because they'll see you without requiring payment. Okay. Um, they have also increased their services. They have an LCSW, and they have, so they have mental health and um, substance abuse counseling. And they, I think they are providing Suboxone at this point too. Okay. So there's a lot of options, and they're on the bus route. So it's, that has been an incredible. Yeah, the bus program. route, the whole bus route thing is pretty great yes, too. Yes, it is. Say. <laughs> <laughs> Just a, a side lot. note on that one. That opened a lot of doors. Yeah, yeah. it definitely did. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. We also work a lot with mountain projects for housing. Okay. Um, we refer a lot of families to the EACH program. Okay, and I'm familiar with the EACH program. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then for employment, um, until we are able to get our employment specialists back, we're relying pretty heavily on NC Works and Goodwill. Okay. Yes. Those are sort of our main partners. Right. So you do have some employment partners. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah to, sure. to help find them mm -hmm. something to... Yeah. And our yeah. employment numbers, I mean, there's a lot of assumptions about folks who are homeless and about folks who are addicted. One, they're not the same all the time. One doesn't mean the other. Yeah. But the other piece of that is there's a lot of thought that anyone at Pathways is freeloading and they're not really doing anything. But 70% of the people who stay here have a stable monthly income. Okay. Um, Fifty percent of those folks are employed, and of the people who are employed, eighty percent are working full time. Right. So the majority of people who are here are moving somewhere. Yes. Um, at their own pace, but okay. they are moving. Yeah, and going somewhere. Those are pretty good numbers. I think you should repeat those. <laughs> repeat those one more time. Um, we have seventy percent of our folks have a stable monthly income of some sort. Um, Fifty percent of our folks are working, and eighty percent of those who are working are working full time. Those are, those are great numbers, yes. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say is a percentage of people that then actually complete the full six months do? Would you say that most that do commit in the beginning and mm -hmm. realize what the rules are, what the mm -hmm. parameters are to being here, yeah. would you say that the majority of them do complete the program then? Well, I think two things. One is you don't have to stay for six months. Okay. So it's that's kind of a limit. Okay. Um, the caveat to that is due to the lack of housing that's available, um, you know, if you've done everything you need to do and you uh, submit an extension form, we'll go ahead and extend you. Because okay. we, don't wanna, I, yeah. we don't want to have you work that hard and then, sorry, you got to go yes. start over. So, start so tell over. me how, how many that you run into that, with the housing thing. Um. I would say at this point, I don't have a firm number, but it, it's more frequent than it used to be. Yeah. I mean, we have 60% of our folks um, on the single side, and 80% and of the families move into housing upon their exit from here. Okay, that's pretty good um, numbers, too. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I would say there's probably, I mean, the whole reason that we move the families to a year is because it takes so long to yeah. buy housing. Yeah. Um, we had a few, a couple of people who stayed here up to a year just because it took so long to be able to put into place. I need a place I can afford that's close enough to walk to work that's safe. Yes. It just takes a while. So many factors that come into some of that stuff that a lot of people just don't think about. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. We, you covered a lot without me having to ask very many <laughs> questions at all. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Okay, so here's a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, being that you know so many of the different avenues, the housing, the, the you know the peer support in the in the jail system, mm -hmm. um, what what would you say are some of the things, and maybe especially as it relates to those that are suffering with substance use mm -hmm. and addiction issues, what would you say are some things that are lacking beyond maybe housing? Because now we have yeah. touched on that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, that's a huge one. Uh, that are lacking in this area that that would be helpful. Yeah, very helpful. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the struggles that the peer supports have is where do people go? So they've gone far and wide. They've driven people three and four hours away from here to make sure that they get to somewhere. 
Um, and that was pre-COVID, <laughs> before everybody said we're not taking anybody new. Yeah. So one of the biggest challenges, I think, is that there's nowhere right here that's inpatient yes. that's a long-term anything. And absolutely. And it's Nothing. really a problem. Um, mm -hmm. I think the other issue is that once people go through detox, let's say they go through detox, they come here, they're clean, they're on the wait list to get into inpatient treatment, then they all of a sudden don't qualify because they're not currently using. So yes, not, and that is, uh, yeah, I would never of, thought about that, but that's very true. You have to have issues, it in your system. None of the issues have been addressed, but they're not using right now. Um, so a lot of people get really frustrated. Oh, that's that. frustrating. That's frustrating yeah. for me. Yeah. <laughs> so I would say probably the number one thing from the, especially the substance use issue is having a place for people to go for long term that's here that um, doesn't require an astronomical payment Yeah. Um, that are, that are, people here can afford to do yeah so when they're ready there's help for them yes when they're ready there's help yep yep that's a big big stumbling block for sure well even the detox thing mm -hmm. I think is kind of a big stumbling block right now here in Haywood mm -hmm. County because with the balsam center that particular wing if you will closing mm -hmm. down yeah, that's <clears throat> so that that makes yeah, yeah hopefully that and yeah. turns around somehow or another I would say too you know one of the things that some folks in the community have been working on is the low barrier shelter. Okay. And so we, you know, we don't want to discriminate against anybody coming in here, but we also have to balance that with what is our mission and what are we able to provide yeah. safely. Can you explain what low barrier mm -hmm. is? And so we pro we require a clean drug screen. Okay. And that's because we're a housing facility. We're not mm -hmm. a treatment facility, and so our staff are not trained for that. Okay. Um, and it's one wide open room. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, there's no That's privacy. a pretty big deal. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I can understand that. So low barrier shelter, according to HUD's definition of that, means that you can come into shelter and receive services regardless of your state. So mm -hmm. if you're actively using or you're actively drinking, you mm -hmm. can still receive shelter. Um, we don't have that here. And in fact, I don't believe it, I, I could be wrong, but I don't believe it, in, it exists in Western North Carolina at all. And so part of the, the challenge with that is there are people who are using who need stable somewhere <coughs> yeah. that's safe to be able to so get they clean. Can, right? yeah. But we don't have that. So I think, um, I don't know how we do that necessarily, but I think you know we have emergency shelter, we have our program, mm -hmm. and we have transitional housing, and we have mm -hmm. permanent. We need the inpatient treatment and the low barrier shelter yes. to get people into that system. I don't shape. think I realize there's not anything in all of Western North Carolina I, I for really that. Don't think I think I know of a couple that would be outpatient treatment mm -hmm. that are allow, you know, someone mm -hmm. in the beginning stages to, mm -hmm. to you know. But I, I think I hadn't really thought about it. But I think that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's another stumbling block for mm -hmm. sure, yeah. especially for when they're ready mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. You know. When they make that decision, there's got to be something then. Right. It, yeah. And you can, t I mean, we've had several women, especially, who <coughs> have such intense trauma backgrounds that coming here is a real challenge for them, but they've made themselves do it. One lady did it. She was here probably 10 different times, and each time she stayed a little bit longer, and she was sober a little bit longer. Yeah. And finally, on the 10th <coughs> time, she made it. And she gets gotten into her own apartment. She's been there for a year and a half, wow. and she's okay. But it took 10 but, years, yeah. you know, to do that. So it's a journey, and I think, um, you know, we have lots of openings along the way to help people. Yeah, and it is a journey. That's that's well said. It is a journey. There's so many that don't get it right the first time. Or the six or seven. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Okay, I think the last question, the last question that I've been at, unless you've got something else to add. Do you have anything more to add that we haven't, that we've missed at all? Probably, but I don't know. <laughs> okay. You want to look over your notes no, real quick? Good. Okay. Okay. I, I feel like we've, we've, I think we've touched on pretty much everything. That, yeah. Um, okay. So the last question that I've been asking everybody, if, if, um, and again, not necessarily focused on addiction, but if, if, you know, substance use, if there was one thing that you could change about the way things work in this area, um, or the way homelessness or substance use is viewed um, those kinds of things if there was one thing that you could change what would that be I think it would be 
for us all to remember that we are all human beings. There's so much, um, it's such a controversial topic and there's so many stereotypes and there's so much stigma that we forget that the people who really need the help are sometimes the people that are hardest to care about. Yeah. And I think, you know, not every person who's addicted is homeless mm -hmm. or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Not every criminal is homeless and vice versa. Um, and especially with COVID being as it is and the mm -hmm. evictions oh, coming, yes. we would do well to remember that a lot of people end up in this situation through no fault of their own. Absolutely. You know, and yes. so much of what you see, I mean, 90% of the people here have such intense trauma backgrounds that... Yeah, half of them didn't have a shot from the beginning. So I think we would do well to remember that, and that would get us a long way yeah. towards finding actual solutions. Yeah, well said. Well said. These are, it's not just a topic we're talking about. We're not just talking about homelessness mm -hmm. or addiction, but we're talking about people mm -hmm. that are homeless and people that are struggling with addiction and substance use. Mm -hmm. These are people. Yeah. I agree. Humans. Yeah. For me, the, the when you bring in the kids, it changes that too. When I was yes. in Durham, this was uh, 15 years ago, there was a mom that came in, she was 26, she had three little girls, they were so excited to be there, they only had nine family rooms in all of Durham County at that time. They finally got in there, they were real excited to be safe, but also real excited because they were staying in the same family room that the mom stayed in when she was a kid. Oh, wow. So for the mom, it was like coming home. Yes. And I think the saddest part is that her mom was still coming into the shelter. Wow. Staying on the women's side. And it was just like, you know, this six-year-old at this point, wow. she's taking care of her mom, who took care mm -hmm. of her mom. And there has to be a point at which somebody says, we have to do something different. Yes. Or it's just going to be the same and yeah. the same. Yeah. Boy, and if that isn't something that we've talked about in some of these other, some of the other interviews yeah. is that, We've been doing the same, go, coming at these issues at the same way for a very long mm -hmm. time. And really, yeah. I mean, yes, there's there are success stories in there. Sure. There are success stories in there. And I sure don't want to yeah, negate those success stories. But yet, the it prevention seems, piece is important. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Yep, there are definitely ways and things that we could do better mm -hmm. and, and maybe just do completely differently yeah. than what mm -hmm. we're doing. Um, <clears throat> and try something different to see if we can tackle some of these issues a, a little bit stronger. Yeah, yeah. agreed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, Mandy, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it today. You're welcome.